Hey everybody, how are you this morning? Wow, so great to be at the 11 a.m. service on Sunday the 9th of December, so close to Christmas. We can now smell it, apparently, for those of you who bake. <laughs> um, I have a love-hate relationship with Christmas because normally I'm not that organised. I do my shopping on about the 22nd, maybe, um, of December. Surprise, surprise though, I already have like five gifts. It's incredible. And I know I deserve a clap for that. And also I have got my Christmas lights out. Now I haven't put them up yet, but they are out. So that's really, that's a start, isn't it? Is anyone else like me? <laughs> Mom? Yep, good, there's a few of us. Well, you know, I'm really excited um, for this theme that we have uh, been talking through over the month of November and into December. Uh, we're nearly at the end of it now. We've got one week left next weekend, but we're talking about I am and the seven statements that Jesus made about Himself in the Gospel of John and what the, we can learn about Jesus through what He said about Himself. So these I am statements, we find uh, they tell us a lot about Jesus. And today I want to talk about this extraordinary statement we find in John eleven twenty five, 25, where he says, I am the resurrection and the life. But before we get into this, I just wanted to tell you a little story about what happened to me in 2012. Now, I had a trip to Cambodia planned and where I was working with an organisation. And just before I went to Cambodia, I decided to make the most of the ticket and spend a week in Burma. And the flight was really, really cheap from KL. So I was determined to make the most of it. And it was an absolute beautiful country. And at the time, there were very few tourists because America had just lifted the sanctions on the country, so not too many people there. But I went to see the amazing Shwedagon Pagoda and I spent a few hours there one afternoon, this giant big pagoda and temple. And I was wandering, I was people watching, I was taking photos and it closed about 7 p.m. This time it was dark and all the crowds were leaving at once. And the thing is, I hadn't really planned my trip back. <laughs> um, I thought I could just get a taxi or something, um, but I noticed there were just hundreds of people all leaving at the same time and all walking back in the direction of the city in a big group. So I thought it would be really easy. I'll just tag on the end of this big group and I would walk straight back in the direction of the city in safety. But then about five minutes into the walk, people started to peel off and stop at bus stops and go down different streets, etc. And all of a sudden I was alone and the street lamps were getting fewer and further between. And so I'm thinking to myself, now, do I go back to a bus stop? Do I try and find somebody to help me? Do I keep walking? not really knowing how far I need to walk until it's safe again, as the city centre was still a few minutes in front of me. And I decided to walk on. It got darker and darker. It got quieter and quieter. And I'm walking down this street in complete darkness by myself, alone in a foreign country, and nobody knew where I was. And every rustle made me jump. But you know, just a few minutes later, street lamps began appearing again and I began to see the hustle and bustle of the city and people and I knew I was fine. But that was the longest few minutes of my life. And looking back now, it, it seems silly, but how did I get into that predicament? I walked where I probably shouldn't have walked by myself as a female, but there seemed to be no turning back. So I kept going. And in John 11, we read a story in which Jesus goes where any sensible person probably shouldn't have gone. It's a story of death, but Jesus gets involved and it ends in life. I wanna give you a little bit of context here. Jesus has just been in Jerusalem. He's been speaking in the temple and the people are not happy with Him. This is towards the end of his ministry and he has just escaped being stoned and has crossed back over the Jordan River away from the city to escape those who are trying to kill him. And there he hears the news that his friend Lazarus is sick. Now Lazarus alongside with his two sisters, Mary and Martha, have been dear friends to Jesus and upon hearing about this sickness, Jesus does kind of a weird thing. He delays going to him for two days and then finally sets off for the town of Bethany towards Jerusalem, going where no sensible person should really go. 
So we're going to read this together. There's, there's a number of scriptures here, but we need to read it to get the idea of what this is about. And we're going to pick it up in verse 17. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. After she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. The teacher is here, she said, and he is asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who had been with Mary in the house comforting her noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to mourn there. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? He asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind have kept this man from dying? Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odour for he has been there for four days. And then Jesus said, did I not tell you if you believe you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out on his hands and, sorry, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. And Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. What an incredible piece of scripture, a resurrection from the dead. Jesus has resurrected a four day old corpse. And you know, this is significant because Jewish belief was that the soul of a dead person remained in the vicinity of the body for three days. But then once decomposition had set in, the soul would depart. So Jesus would have no mistaking, Lazarus was definitely dead. And the seven days of mourning were well underway. At first glance, the Lazarus story seems to be about Jesus bringing back his friend from the dead. Often it is presented as a demonstration of the friendship that Jesus had with Mary, Martha and Lazarus, but it also highlights Jesus' capacity for human grief and the power of faith and prayer. But it also signifies something even more important. Jesus announces to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. He wants us to see so much more in this story. And so this resurrection of Lazarus acts as a kind of foretelling, if you like, about what His resurrection will mean for you and for me. You see, Jesus didn't just perform a resurrection. He is the resurrection. He didn't just come back to life. He is life. So we are now well into the season of Advent. It's that time where we anticipate Jesus coming to earth as a baby and we realise the resurrection is also the story of the incarnation. It's about God breaking through into our world as Jesus and becoming the one who would suffer and die and be resurrected for all of humanity, for all of creation. 
And so the passage that we've just read in John 11 is the lead up to Jesus' last weeks on earth. And we get to see His power over natural law. We get to see His power over life and death. And we get to see His power and Lordship over the grave. And it's so important for us to understand Jesus as the resurrection and the life, because for us, we still live in a world of death. We still live in a tomb world. There's darkness everywhere and nobody escapes suffering. Now, I'm not here to ruin everybody's day and Christmas season because it is supposed to be the happiest time of the year, isn't it? But you know what? Don't we all like to bury our heads in the sand and pretend that what's happening out there in our world isn't really happening? It's not a new thing. It's been happening for all of human history. Funny that human beings always equal human misery. We find ways of exploiting and lying to each other, ways of locking children up and getting involved in wars that we shouldn't be involved in. The gap between the rich and the poor, it keeps growing. Our clothes and our household goods are made in sweatshops and under the heavy cloud of forced labour. Our Western world is built upon the scourge of colonialism from which Indigenous people all over the world and especially here in Australia still haven't recovered. There is so much death. There is so much misery and humanity has caused it all for each other. Humanitarian Gary Haugen reminds us, you are probably not regularly being threatened with being enslaved, imprisoned, beaten, raped or robbed. But if you were among the world's poorest billions, you would be. Often it's simply the ovarian lottery that decides just how much we will experience suffering whilst here on earth. And you know what? We can turn off the news. We can look the other way. But it doesn't mean it's not happening. The world is a tomb in which humanity is dying in the dark but there is actually good news. (laughs) Thank goodness some of you are saying, really good news. Jesus came to confront and to overcome that culture of death. The whole point of God's plan is that all of creation would be restored and reconciled to God and that all of creation would know what it is to flourish because of Jesus. That's what the resurrection has achieved. The pivotal point in history because where that became not only possible, but inevitable. So today I wanna talk into two points as we explore the implications of Jesus' I am statement. So first, we very simply need to experience the resurrection and the life. In the story of Lazarus, Jesus calls him friend. But in this context, Lazarus represents more than that. According to some theologians, Lazarus also represents humanity. The story of the raising of Lazarus demonstrates how Jesus has come to call everyone and every culture out of the tombs of death and destruction and into new life. When Jesus arrives at Bethany, Lazarus was dead in the tomb. The stench of death was all around him. His body was decaying. There was no hope. There was no life, there was no future. But I want us to notice and read again what it says in verse 43. When he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. I don't know about you, but I don't think there's too much science in the area of resurrection. It's still kind of an unexplored field. (laughs) But notice with me that somehow the dead cells that made up Lazarus's body They came back to life at the words of Jesus. The resurrection spoke and death had to submit. The words of Jesus caused the stagnant blood to begin pulsing through Lazarus's veins once more. What an incredible thought. The words of the resurrection and the life brought resurrection and life. 
And you know what? This wasn't just about the resurrection of Lazarus or the future promises of our physical resurrection, but about experiencing new life today and every day. Jesus isn't just talking here about future resurrection. He's talking about present resurrection. And Jesus is calling us. He's calling Monique, come out. Raymond, come out. Stella, come out. Come out of death and destruction. Come out and into the resurrection life that I have for you. And you know, I don't care what you know or what you believe or what you're even doubting here today or not sure of right now. But I want each one of us to know this. Jesus loves you. Jesus sees you. And Jesus wants you to experience resurrection life, new life, His resurrection power today and every day. And so to live with Jesus as your Lord and friend is to experience your resurrection every day. He is moving us towards perfection. And you know, John's persistent theme is this, Jesus, the God of life, confronts the power of death itself and calls humanity to live in the new life of resurrection here and now. Now, the other gospel writers, they speak of resurrection as a future reality. And John doesn't dispute this, but he adds this new thing. That is to say, we can live today without fear of death. We are free to renounce it. We are free to confront it. We are free to undermine the culture that is built on it. And we are free to enjoy the fullness of God's life within us and among us. Who can say amen to that? Isn't that good news? You know, Daniel Berrigan, a Jesuit priest once said, the life of Jesus was a life which could not be contained by death. It was a risen life even before resurrection had occurred. And John in his roundabout way sets his thesis before us. We too are summoned out of the culture of death into Jesus' generative ways. All of us are called to share the risen life here and now. And yet church, living in this space is a dance. It's a dance of the now, but the not yet. It's living between hope and frustration. And I know that there are many of you here today who are sitting here wondering how we'll ever get this right. How do we live in the present hope of the resurrection when life is hard, when bad things have happened and where despair seems to take over? Well, you know, about a decade ago, a friend of mine died. She'd had a long battle with cancer and she fought like hell, but she didn't make it. And both her and her husband had an incredible unwavering unwavering faith that she would be healed, that God would come through for them. And after she passed away, her husband continued to believe for God to show up and to do the impossible. And he prayed for nearly 24 hours for her resurrection. And eventually he had to give in and know that God had had this final word, final word. And perhaps we might call that denial because she didn't come back from the dead. She wasn't healed. She was buried and she's still missed by her two young girls who are now young adults. But you know, her husband went on to continue to believe for healing for people. And he went on to continue to do what he believes is something very specific that God has called him to. And out of the darkness of losing his wife, out of the confusion of unanswered prayer, he held onto those words of Jesus, I am the resurrection and the life. And he continued to believe for the impossible for others. Out of death came a ministry of life. And you know, I believe, church, that his story is just one example of what it's like to live in this tension of living within a culture of death, which ultimately only God can bring to an end and yet holding on to the resurrection power that is ours to live out in the here and the now. So how do we live with the resurrection as part of our everyday? 
by living closely with Jesus every day, by walking and talking with Him, by staying close to Him as He breathes resurrection life into our bodies and into our minds and into our hearts. He revives our souls. He puts strength to our weariness and He waters those seemingly lifeless seeds in the right time until those seeds germinate and then they sprout and they begin to grow. When dreams die, when relationships die, when hope is gone, we invite Him in. We invite Him, Him who is the resurrection, to come and breathe new life again. There's a beautiful quote by author Barbara Brown Taylor. New life starts in the dark, whether it is a seed in the ground, a baby in the womb, or Jesus in the tomb, it starts in the dark. You see, the tomb, church, is not the final word. Death never has the last say when Jesus is around. And the second thing that I wanna talk about today is that we need to also carry on the work of the resurrection. In the second half of verse 44, I wanna read that again for you. Jesus said to them, "'Take off the grave clothes and let him go.'" Now, this is weird. I think this is a bit strange because Jesus has just prayed to the Father. He has commanded Lazarus to rise and walk and the impossible has happened. Lazarus has shuffled out of the tomb, but he's still bound by these grave clothes. The miracle didn't seem to extend somehow as to get rid of these grave clothes and make them disappear from his body. But you know, I love that about God because all throughout the Bible, we see this same pattern. God works to transform and reconcile and do the impossible and yet never wanting to do it without our partnership, always wanting to get His people involved. Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let Him go. You take them off. He'd perform this mighty miracle. He'd raise this guy from the dead. And yet He says to those around Lazarus, no, now you be a part of the miracle too and you take those grave clothes off. You see, God will do, God will do miraculous things in our world, but He loves to do it with us. We have discovered through the account of Lazarus this incredible thing, that resurrection is for here and now. It's for everybody, but He wants His people involved. For we are God's fellow workers, the Apostle Paul tells the Corinthian church. If we are free to defy death, we are also free to pour out our lives for others. We are free to look around for death's victims, to offer compassion and to secure justice and to beat swords into plowshares and to stop following the ways of war and destruction. Jesus did not set us free, church, to continue to be complicit in the ways of death. He set us free to work with Him hand in hand to bring life. He's asked us to partner with Him in outright defiance of the death that we witness in the world. And you know what? Sometimes this means, just like Jesus did, that we walk towards death, that we walk where people will tell us we probably shouldn't go. Because the irony of the story of the resurrection of Lazarus is that it was the beginning of the end of Jesus' life on earth. This journey to resurrect Lazarus, it took him towards death. It took him towards Jerusalem where he would ultimately hang on a cross. And so just like Jesus, we need to learn to walk towards distress and discomfort. Who knows that although Jesus has called us to this life of victory and purpose, He hasn't called us just to hide behind these as buzzwords. He's called us to help other people experience that victory and purpose too. And that involves walking towards mess and discomfort, walking towards chaos and heartache, and yes, sometimes even death. But because of that resurrection power inside of us, because of Jesus' promise for the future, we walk towards these things with hope, knowing that we can also bring that hope to others. This resurrection power is not for you and I to keep to ourselves. It's not just for certain people groups. It's not just for a select few. It's for the whole world. So what is this work of the resurrection? It's human flourishing. It's God's original intent for humanity. The end of exploitation, the end of persecution and racism. It's the end of inequality and suffering. And it's the end of greed and selfishness 
and hate. You know, in the late 1700s, there was a group of Christians in England and they campaigned for the abolition of slavery. You may have heard of them. They were known as the Clapham sect. And William Wilberforce, the famous politician, he was probably the most well-known of all of the group, but there was a number of them. And most members of this group, they were rich and powerful influences in England at the time. And yet getting involved in abolition, it brought significant social issues. It brought significant stigma for them because at the time abolitionists were viewed as radical. They were viewed as dangerous revolutionaries and certainly not something that a good Christian should be involved in. But you know, slavery was not the only issue that they worked on. They inspired hundreds of groups in England to tackle social issues such as the exploitation of women and children, poverty, illiteracy, and they used politics to achieve prison reform, gambling reform, and they prevented cruel sports that abused animals. Here was a group of Jesus followers who refused to stick their heads in the sand They partnered with Jesus walking towards death in order to help bring life to hundreds of thousands of others. They brought an end to the transatlantic slave trade through their dogged determination in the belief that every human being has the right to life and a future. And so if we are to carry on the work of resurrection in partnership with Jesus, We need to have a fresh revelation of how central that was to the ministry of Jesus. You see, Jesus came, He said, to give sight to the blind, to give freedom to the captive, liberation to the oppressed and good news to the poor. And in each case, He called people to the fullness of life and to victory over the powers of death and destruction. But I also wanna see us to see something with fresh eyes. Jesus the resurrection and the life, walking towards Jerusalem for the last time in order to once and for all confront the powers of death. You see, the critical climax in Jesus' ministry comes when He turns from His healing and preaching ministry in Galilee and He heads towards Jerusalem to confront the most violent institutions of His day. And by stirring the viper's nest, he he knew the consequences. He knew what he was gonna be walking towards. But Jesus was neither passive nor afraid. He was provocative. He was courageous. And dare we say, he was revolutionary. And that is why the resurrection account of Lazarus is that dramatic culmination of John's gospel because these proprietors of death, the Sadducees, the Herodians, the followers of Pilate, all who benefited from Rome's occupation of Israel at the time, they all felt in Jesus' message a personal threat. And so they plotted His death. Because the thing is, they could not run their empire. They could not live off the backs of the poor. They couldn't exploit the weak. If someone is busy preaching freedom to the captives and liberation to the oppressed and good news to the poor, they couldn't do it. So they plot to kill Him. But Jesus persists and He goes on. And He keeps on walking towards death. And He keeps on walking and walking until it ends, not in death, but in resurrection life, not only for Him, but for each one of us. And so from now on, lovers of God are free and the sting of death is completely gone and our resurrection has begun. And in confronting the tomb, Jesus confronts every culture of death throughout history, including our own that we live in today. And as His followers, we are summoned to continue His story, to take up His campaign and engage the culture of death by insisting on the fullness of life for everyone around us. And so if we are to be people who believe in the resurrection, both the one happening in us day by day and the one to come, then we won't be people who create more destruction, more wounds, more death, nor will we be people who allow more destruction and death. We get to begin to live resurrection now and to be people who practise resurrection every day. God wants you to be whole. He wants you and I to be full of resurrection life. 
but He also wants you to bring that resurrection life to others in partnership with Him. It's not just for us. It's for us to carry that resurrection life within us. And you know, the New Testament declares that there's a time coming when we in our world will be remade. And the resurrection of Jesus was that prototype of the future of creation. This morning, I just want each one of you just to close your eyes as we read this Scripture. And I want God to speak to you as you get an idea of this vision of what it's gonna be like. Revelation 21, three to five. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and He will dwell with them. They will be His people and God Himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. And he who is seated on the throne said, I am making all things new, all things new. I just want each person here, just with your eyes closed and your head bowed, to contemplate what that means for you today. All things new. For many of us here today, we need God to make all things new right now, today, in our families, in our lives, in our circumstances. But simultaneously, He's also calling us to enter into all things new for the whole world. It's not something that you have to wait. It's not something that you have to be perfect in order to be a part of. God actually works in our brokenness to minister to others who are broken. But today, first of all, I wanna speak to those of you who are suffering grief and loss because He will wipe away your tears. Those who are suffering through mental or physical health issues, God will restore your health to perfection. If it happens sooner, fantastic. I hope that it does. I pray that it does. But if it doesn't, it'll still be yours one day. Perfection will still be yours one day. Those that have been abused, cast aside, rejected, God will bring His justice. He'll make things right. He will make things right. But we mustn't just look inward. God calls us to take our pain, take our rejection and loss and allow Him to work with it. Healing, but also using it to minister to others to reach out to our world with that resurrection power and see life flowing back to those who are experiencing death. Behold, I'm making all things new. And so Jesus just asks each one of us, will you give Him your pain and your brokenness today? Will you let Him do something with it? Will you allow His resurrection power to flow through you? Those wounds so He can use you in new and life-giving ways. Father, I pray right now in Jesus' Name for every person in this room. God, You see hearts, You see those in despair, You see those hoping against all hope. And Father, I pray right now that You are ministering to each and every one of them, that You are bringing peace and comfort and healing and wholeness. But Lord, I thank You that You have also called each one of us, no matter where we stand, no matter what has happened to us, You have called us, Lord, to participate in Your resurrection on behalf of others. You've called us to usher in Your resurrection and bring life that trumps death and destruction. So I pray today that You will just put a new heart in each one of us, that You will give us new eyes to see what You wanna do and give us, Lord, just a fresh vision of what You are doing in us and in, our, in the world around us. In the Name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen, church. Awesome.